Good morning and welcome to another edition of the Sunday History Rewind. I'm your host, Jim Lumley. 244 years ago, when Thomas Jefferson penned the words to the Declaration of Independence, he began with these words, When in the course of human events, history is the story of human events, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we must never forget our history, especially American history. This morning, I'm going to air two tape interviews with my favorite historian, David McCullough. McCullough is a Pulitzer Prize winning author. I have two of his books here in my presidential library, the great biography on John Adams and on Harry Truman, and he also wrote a splendid biography on Teddy Roosevelt. David McCullough, perhaps better than any of us, can articulate why American history is important. Remember, it was George Santanana that said in 1917, those who don't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. There's a well-known saying that those who don't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. That's part of the message in the new book by historian and author David McCullough. He's earned two Pulitzer Prizes, two National Book Awards, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. That is the nation's highest civilian honor. His book is The American Spirit, Who We Are and What We Stand For, and is a collection of his speeches over the past 28 years. The book is published by Simon & Schuster, a division of CBS. David, good morning. Good morning. So wonderful to have you here, as I'm such a mm. fan of yours, including the book about Truman. Um, you've been giving speeches for 50 years. I have. Why did you decide to put them together in this book? Because I feel that we're going through a very difficult and uh, unprecedented experience as a country right now and that we need to be reminded and with respect of who we are and what we stand for and what our predecessors went through to achieve what we too often take for granted mm -hmm. and set standards for us to live up to. Reminded of what? Well, that we believe in honesty, mm -hmm. that we believe in hard work and loyalty, we believe in love of country beyond just a lot of flag waving and mouthing off of cliches. Mm -hmm. That we believe in improvement and accomplishment and that we believe that we have a way of life like none else in the world mm -hmm. and we not only want to maintain it, but we want to improve it. You said that there's always going to be problems in the country. It's never always. smooth. It's never been easy. But you told the graduates at Ohio in 2004, the many will always believe this country's going to the dogs, but 90% of the people in this country are good law-abiding citizens, and we forget that. Exactly you still right. still believe that? Absolutely, and we need to be reminded of it. I'm still out in the country talking to students, talking to people in lecture halls, and, mm -hmm. and I like to stress that if you know your history, if you know your country's story, the human side of the story, you'll never take it for granted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you'll always be grateful to those who went before us, who not only had the faith that they did, but who did the work that needed to be done and risked their lives very often. You've, going... always, you've always stressed the importance of a liberal arts education and an and education in history, world history and U.S. history. Indeed, absolutely. I think history, the English language and history are to me the two most important of all subjects for everybody to know. And kids don't know their history. And people say. in positions of leadership particularly. They have to know cause and effect. They have to know not only what previous presidents, let's say, did, mm -hmm. but what they didn't do, which was often as important, the decisions they didn't make. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and their use of the English language. Mm -hmm. The people who have been most inspiring for us we all know who they were, have been people who used, knew how to use words. Abraham Lincoln, John Kennedy. Do you know it's been 56 years mm -hmm. since the President of the United States asked us to do something for our country? Yeah. yeah. And a lot of us in that day, that's when I was first trying to figure out what I wanted to do in my life, we took it, we took it to heart. 
and we went to do something for our country. Yeah. And we've not, we've not been the same ever since I know. in a great variety of fields. Yeah. David, I thought about that because you start with Simon Willard's clock, the, the speech that you gave to the Joint Address of Congress, and you just talk about these great Americans that served in Congress. You know, when Americans hate Congress, have a 9% approval rating, you remind us all that it's Congress that passed the Homestead Act, ended slavery, the GI Bill, the Marshall Plan, I mean, right. on and on and on, these great things that Congress has done for our country and the great people that served. No, you said it's not always been an unbroken parade of clowns. No. <laughs> Which I thought was a very you. interesting way of... <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes we have a run on them, but... <laughs> no, but, um, but you're still an optimist. Yes, I am. Yes. Why? The glass is half full. Yeah. yeah. No, I, because so much of what is, a, is actually happening isn't reported because it's good news. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But this, this is my favorite line in your book. You told graduates in 1994, if you're happy, you think better. Yes. Do you think that's true? Yes. If you're happy, you think better. Right, one I of think the most impressive right. pages in your book, by I'm the way, not... the dedication page. To your... I, know. I counted 19 grandchildren? Yes. Congratulations. And it's dedicated to them because my hope is that the values that are expressed in the actions and words and and, accompli and accomplishments of our predecessors will go on into their generation too. We are an optimistic people by nature. And we've always had reason to be optimistic. We also have always had reason to think we're a nation in decline. That's nothing new about that. You could go back and read the letters of Henry Adams and written in the 19th century in a country who was just going to hell. And still I, I grew up in a Republican <laughs> family and the night of the 48 election, I couldn't stay awake. So next morning I got up and my father was in the sh bathroom shaving. And I said, Dad, Dad, who won? He said, Truman. <laughs> it's like it was the end of the world. Well, 30 some years later, I was back home and he was telling me all about how the world's going to hell and the country's going to hell. And I th heard this so much in my life. And then he paused and he said, too bad old Harry isn't still in the White House. <laughs> and, and that's what we want, is somebody who will address the problems and, and do things that aren't popular. David McCullough's books have all come from a machine invented about the time Abe Lincoln was president. Some of you may recognize it as a typewriter. I bought it when I was embarking on my first book in the mid, early 1960s. He calls this World Headquarters, an 8 by 12 foot sanctuary in his backyard on Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. Why do you use this as opposed to a computer? I can't press the wrong button and eliminate a month's work. <laughs> From his trusty royal have come books about the Johnstown Flood, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Panama Canal, and the Revolutionary War and biographies of three presidents, John Adams, Teddy Roosevelt, Harry Truman. The only way to teach history, to write history, to bring people into the magic of transforming yourself into other times is through the vehicle of the story. It isn't just a chronology, it's about people. History is human. Jefferson, when in the course of human events. Human is the operative word there. And human rhymes with Truman. The unlikely victor in that presidential election McCullough slept through as a teenager. Every candidate running for any office ought to study the, the Harry Truman 1948 campaign. I think what's important about it, he ran by being himself. And he said, I'm gonna go out there and say what I mean. Can you imagine <laughs> a politician taking that as his approach? And people loved it. The papers, the pundits, all agreed Truman didn't have a chance against Tom Dewey. Even when Truman started drawing big crowds campaigning by train. It was the first time any president had ever done that. He would pull into these little stops where nobody would ever stop and give a talk. I'm coming out here so you can look at me and hear what I have to say and then make up your own minds as to whether you believe some of the same things that have been said about your president. He wasn't smooth. He wasn't glib. He just talked straight. He said, I'm going to go out there and give him hell. And 
later on he said, I didn't give them hell, I just told them the truth and they thought it was hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, there seems to be a trend and the trend is for doing it. Election night, it was all over for Truman until it wasn't. The morning after that in St. Louis, was handed this paper, which said, Dewey defeats Truman. Of course, he wished he had, but he didn't, and that's all there was to it. Authenticity. It worked. Authenticity. When Thomas Jefferson beat John Adams. The mudslinging in that campaign Brutal. makes today's look quite tame. Well, Jefferson was paying a slander specialist, a journalist, uh, to go after Adams and writing that he was a, uh, mentally unbalanced, he was a hermaphrodite, all these things. <laughs> and, hermaphrodite. Yeah. <laughs> the Adams camp fired back, saying if Jefferson were elected, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest would sweep the land. A gentler time? Hardly. It was rough and tough when Adams was vice president presiding over the House of Representatives. They went at each other on the floor with fire tongs. They grabbed the fire tongs off and kept hammering each other. Imagine how that would look on the nightly news. <laughs> In the long history of this country, who was the greatest president? George Washington was our greatest president in that he set the standard. and He had no example to go by. If he had been a fool, or a self-indulgent, lazy, glory hound, it could have been disastrous. Uh, he did everything right. Philadelphia, where the first fires of the American Revolution were fanned. This is where our country began, not in a grand presence, but in a space that's really quite small, but beautiful. I love this building. It's Carpenter's Hall, where delegates from the 13 colonies met for the first time in 1774 to air in secret their grievances against British rule. It was treasonous talk. They closed the windows so nobody could come up and listen at the window. Because there were so many British sympathizers exactly. here in Philadelphia. Exactly. And they wanted to know who were the ringleaders, what were they saying. Was that a real worry for these men, that they would be taken and hanged? Yes, certainly was. And when... Um, when they rode away from their homes, their families, uh, they knew that possibly they'd never see them again. Upstairs in the hall, there's a library, the country's very first lending library. It was Ben Franklin's idea. At the very beginning comes the idea of learning, of books, of ideas. Ben Franklin still watches over this city, and so does George Washington. Tell me something, as a historian, you get any funny feelings when you wander around Philadelphia? Now, Morley, you understand I don't believe in ghosts. You, you, that's you, clear. Okay. But at night, walking up Market Street or Chestnut Street, going past where they all lived and convened, gets very quiet. I know that they're here. <laughs> they really, you feel it. You feel it. Walk around at night. Walk over to the cemetery at Christ Church just up the way here. You'll feel it. You might feel it, too, at the city tavern, the watering hole for Franklin and the others, where, after hours, they plotted revolution. This is the place where George Washington and John Adams first met. This was the hangout, and it was loud, it was lively. <laughs> well, I would like to start with Mr. Washington's yeah. beer and say, here's to our founding father. <laughs> it's a walk of just a few short blocks from the city tavern to the most revered site in Philadelphia, the old Pennsylvania Colonial State House, Independence Hall, where in July 1776, the colonies, already at war with Britain, voted on making the final break. Can you give me a sense of, of the atmosphere in this room on that day in 1776? The atmosphere is, t is tense, and it's, it's um, exciting. It was very, very hot. It was summertime in Philadelphia, with flies biting through their silk stockings. This is on July 2nd, not on July 4th. 
Nothing really happened on July 4th. That was the date that was on the document when it was printed. The document, of course, was the Declaration of Independence from Britain. The writing of it was largely Jefferson's work. This is an early draft in his handwriting. In this room, Thomas Jefferson never, never stood up to say much of anything, ever. He left that to others to do. Not a speaker. Not a speaker. And when he spoke, his voice was weak. He would be terrible on television today. Franklin Alf often looked as though he were asleep. And his admirers and friends said he thought, if I, if I look like I'm asleep, people might say things they wouldn't say in front of me if I were awake. <laughs> Adams was short and stout and cranky and abrasive, but honest and courageous. And he had great humor. To those still wavering, John Adams' speech turned the tide. It was delivered during a thunderstorm, an hour long, but carrying a short message. Adams insisted now was the time, now was the time. Whether you celebrate it on the 2nd or the 4th of July, John Adams also spelled out how it should be observed. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade with guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward forevermore, which is remarkable when you consider that these colonies were just on this side of the Allegheny Mountains, and the idea that he's seeing it all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So they, they dreamed big, and we ought to remember that in this little room.